So we're going to get started. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Omar Dahi. I'm the Director of Security and Context and a Professor of Economics at Hampshire College. <coughs> uh, welcome to our webinar today titled War in Gaza and US Policy. After decades of marginalization, the Hamas attacks of October 7th and subsequent Israeli bombing of the Gaza Strip has brought the Israeli-Palestinian conflict back to the center of the international agenda. While most countries issuing public statements condemn the attacks by Hamas, there is an increasing divergence between North American and many European countries on the one hand and many countries around the world, particularly in the global south, uh, on their stance towards the continuation of the conflict, particularly as Israel's blockade and bombing of Gaza are being condemned as war crimes. As the humanitarian situation in Gaza becomes more catastrophic, there have been widespread calls for a ceasefire. In this light, the policy of the U.S. has come under scrutiny. This webinar will discuss and focus on U.S. policy in the current war, both in the short run, as well as with an overall U.S. policy towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in general, and perhaps the broader Middle Eastern policy. Joining us to discuss these are four experts on the Middle East and U.S. policy, all of whom have a distinguished record as scholars or practitioners of policy in the region, and all of whom have written or spoken recently since October 7th about the conflict. Uh, I have asked my guests to each give an opening few minutes, opening statement of a few minutes, around five minutes or so, uh, and we'll follow up with uh, some questions and have a discussion, uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, if you want to ask questions, please uh, use the chat function or the Q&A function, I'll try my best to integrate those questions as we go along. Uh, I might group them if we end up having a lot of, a lot of different questions. Um, but I'll introduce my guests as, you know, one by one as they're going to speak. And we'll start with uh, Matt Duss. Matt, thank you for joining us. Um, Matt is the Executive Vice President of the Center for International Policy and former Foreign Policy Advisor for Bernie Sanders. Uh, Matt, you wrote an article in Foreign Policy on the 19th of October, I believe, um, titled The End of Biden's Middle East Mirage, where you, um, among other things, and I'll just quote very briefly, uh, talked about um, that uh, pr President Biden's doctrine for the Middle East, as outlined by Brett McKirk, who's the Deputy Assistant to the President and National Security Coordinator for the Middle East, um, shows vanishingly little concern for how the people of the region are ruled, and its brief mention of values component is so perfunctory as to be insulting. Um, can you comment a little bit more and tell us your assessment of kind of US policy right now? What is it and what is it trying to accomplish? Sure. Well, first, um, I just want to thank you, Omar, for having me on this panel. I want to greet all of my, my panelists. It's great to see you all, um, good friends and, and colleagues. Um, I just want to start my brief remarks here today by just acknowledging the absolute extraordinary human cost of what we are seeing right now before I even get into my analysis, the deaths in Gaza, the deaths we are seeing in the West Bank, and of course, the, the staggering horror we all witnessed on October 7th. Um, so I just want to sit for a moment with that and understand, you know, even as we, we talk in these analytical terms, we are talking about people's lives and this this is an ongoing catastrophe that I very much hope and pray it will not become uh, worse, although it seems unfortunately that it that it will. Um, so my piece was looking at Biden's approach to the Middle East, which essentially, as I, as I laid it out, um, was, you know, even though the Biden administration came into office sort of holding the, the Abraham Accords at arm's length, uh, the Abraham Accords, of course, you know, brokered um, under the Trump administration, the agreement between the UAE and Israel, uh, normalization. Um, they, you know, Biden quickly kind of turned and embraced the Abraham Accords as kind of a formula for, you know, regional integration. Um, all of this, in my view, and I think there's good evidence for this, um, is just because their approach to the region and their approach to foreign policy in general is to see it through the lens, everything through the lens of strategic competition with China. Um, so they want to pay less attention to the Middle East. Um, previous administrations have wanted to do that as well. 
but their their approach, the you know, the doctrine laid out by Brett McGurk in, in that speech that he gave that I cite was essentially they're going to move forward trying to get these deals signed between Israel and these various um, you know, repressive, un undemocratic governments. Um, these are going to involve selling these governments lots of arms. Um, and so essentially, as I put it, they're going to stitch together a bunch of regional arms deals and call that peace. Um, and a big component of this was the presumption that the, the Palestinians could simply be put aside, could be put into a corner, offered some small measures of, quote unquote, improving their lives, um, but otherwise essentially be ignored. Um, and I think that um, I, I just always suspected that was not going to work. This issue, the Palestinian-Israeli issue, has a way of reasserting itself on the regional agenda and the global agenda, often with, with great casualties. Um, and unfortunately, we are seeing that very graphically displayed right now. Um, so, you know, what I would hope, I, 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 we, have, we haven't seen a plan yet. We haven't seen um, any indication that they really know that the security concept has failed. Um, I understand we're in a situation right now where they are not really, you know, their focus right now seems to be to try to at least put the brake on, on 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 a worse escalation by Israel um, and contain the, the the fighting and the dying um, to Gaza. Um, but I would hope um, that they are ready to rethink um, this approach. I have not seen any evidence of that yet, so I'll just stop there. And once again, thank you and and all my colleagues. Thank you, Matt. I'd like to bring in uh, Sarah Lee Whitson. Um, thank you for joining us, Sarah. Uh, Sarah is the executive director of Don, which um, is the uh, democracy for the Arab World Now organization and former director of the Middle East North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch. Um, Sarah, over the past uh, few weeks, through your social media accounts and your commentaries, you focused on um, the bombardment and the humanitarian catastrophe, and as well as the the laws of war. Um, recently, you were at a podcast, non-zero podcast, talking about those. Um, tell us a little bit more about your your assessment of, of what's happening and what you've been calling for. Um, what I was saying um, is that the uh, massive bombardment of Gaza, um, just 400 uh, uh, bombs deployed uh, in the last eight hours, for example, um, and the probably unprecedented extreme of the siege that's imposed on the people of Gaza, um, the, the blockade that is keeping out not just medicine, not just food, but water, uh, electricity, fuel, um, is really just a continuation and expansion, uh, of, you know, a steroidal magnification of what Israel has been doing in Gaza since 2006. Um, and obviously, if it's not obvious, maybe uh, uh, let me explain um, that a siege, a blockade uh, on uh, civilians, depriving them of items essential uh, to their survival is a war crime. Uh, indiscriminate bombardment of civilians, of civilian areas, of civilian objects, like the hundreds of apartment buildings that have been demolished by Israel, where uh, entire extended families uh, uh, live uh, is a war crime and deliberate targeting of civilians uh, is a war crime. So uh, from an international law perspective, uh, it's very clear um, that Israel's conduct uh, in its war in Gaza uh, uh, breaches all norms and standards uh, of how uh, a party of the conflict is entitled uh, to fight. Um, and I think as our focus is on U.S. policy, um, what's particularly stunning about this is the extent to which the United States uh, has not only given Israel a green light uh, to proceed with uh, uh, abuses, uh, to proceed with violations uh, of IHL um, that were and if the ICC acts as a neutral uh, court would, would definitely lead to criminal liability for Israeli officials, but the US is actively preventing the international community from even getting a temporary 
a pause in the fighting, a humanitarian, so-called humanitarian ceasefire, a temporary halt in the fighting. Um, the U.S. was the sole country to veto the U.N. Security Council resolution um, uh, put forward by Brazil, uh, uh, which otherwise would have passed. So we are now in a situation where uh, the international community desperately wants to stop the fighting, i.e. wants to stop Israeli bombardment uh, and the siege of Gaza. But the United States is preventing that from happening so that Israel can continue with its war crimes. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for accommodating by switching to your phone. Uh, it's, it's very clear, so I appreciate that. Sorry to make you start over. Um, I guess I'll turn next to Moain. Uh, Moain Rabani, uh, Middle East analyst and co-editor of Jadalia. Uh, Moain, your article about 10 days ago, I believe, on October 14th, uh, was titled US and Europe give Israel a free hand. Have you updated your assessment or what's your analysis of what's been happening? Thank you very much, much uh, Omar, for organizing this um, timely event um, at this critical time and inviting me to participate in it. Um, I haven't really updated my assessment. I jotted down um, 10 points um, that I'd like to briefly um, uh, read out concerning US policy towards this war. Um, the first and, for and most important observation about US policy in this context is its unconditional support of Israel. More specifically, its unconditional support of Israel's mass killings of Palestinian civilians, its unconditional supply of advanced weaponry to Israel and the full knowledge that these are being used to commit war crimes and crimes against humanity on a systematic basis, and its unconditional deployment of its political and diplomatic influence to ensure Israel can continue to engage in mass killings of civilian non-combatants with its medieval siege tactics and do so with unrestricted impunity. To put it bluntly, the United States is an active and complicit partner in Gaza's killing fields, and judging by the official statements coming out of Washington, is also exceptionally proud of its role. More sheepishly, the US government has knowingly embraced the agenda of greater Israel, championed by Netanyahu, Ben Gvir, and Smotrich. It's exclusively rhetorical nods to Israeli-Palestinian peace, and for that matter, the humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip are just that, and therefore entirely meaningless. The unconditional embrace of Israel nevertheless masks an important development that in my view has received insufficient attention. A collapse in US confidence in the Israeli political and military leadership and a collapse in US confidence in Israel's military and intelligence capabilities. This is far more serious than during the 1973 October war. In 1973, the Israeli military experienced a resource crisis that could be compensated by massive US arms deliveries. In 2023, Israel is by contrast experiencing a crisis of ability, which no amount of US advanced weaponry can compensate for. This collapse in confidence will have significant long-term consequences for the US-Israel relationship. Israel will eventually lose its status as the US's stationary aircraft carrier in the Middle East, as it was once described by Ronald Reagan. US decision makers, particularly but not limited to the military and intelligence fields, will no longer take their cues from their Israeli counterparts and begin to treat their swaggering pretensions to omniscience and omnipotence with the skepticism these have always deserved. The USS Israel is today seen as a rather leaky trawler in urgent need of repair to remain seaworthy in the shape of not one, but two US aircraft carrier groups. There is growing evidence that the United States is playing a direct role in Israeli decision-making. Blinken, rather than Netanyahu, is leading discussions of the Israeli emergency war cabinet. And Biden, during his recent visit, played a similar role 
Washington has dispatched senior military officers and several thousand Marines to Israel, formally to insist in the planning of operations, but I suspect to take control of Israeli military operations. And as mentioned, two US aircraft carrier groups have been sent to the Eastern Mediterranean because Israel is judged as incapable of simultaneously confronting irregular forces on both its Northern and Southern borders. In my view, these US forces have been deployed neither to fight on Israel's behalf, nor primarily to take the lead on the civilian hostage file, nor laughably to ensure humanitarian assistance to the Gaza Strip. Their main task is, I believe, to ensure that Israel's military, whose leadership is in chaos and disarray, and whose ground forces are no longer a serious fighting force, does not launch a ground offensive unless and until they adopt a strategy and objectives that Washington believes are attainable. For a variety of domestic, regional, and geopolitical considerations, Washington is unwilling to countenance another Israeli failure and won't give Israel's leaders the freedom of action to inflict additional failure upon themselves. Washington's approach encompasses not only a military dimension, but also a political one. What is to replace that which Israel seeks to destroy? Here, I think the proposals put forward by Steve Simon, Robert Satloff of Wynep, Ehud Barak, and of course, Thomas Friedman most recently, broadly reflect US government thinking. Like so much that emerges from the Washington echo chamber when it comes to Israel and Palestine, I think it's based on excessively generous helpings of wishful thinking. Here are some of its moving parts. Successfully eradicate Hamas and other militant groups with a military force that on 7 October collapsed like a house of cards. Perpetuate the political administrative severance of the Gaza Strip from the West Bank through a UN mandate that will enjoy Russian, Chinese, and Arab acquiescence in the Security Council. Send in Arab troops because their governments are eager to ensure Israel faces no further Palestinian hostility and will be welcomed in the rubble of Gaza with rice and flowers. Persuade Saudi Arabia to foot the reconstruction bill produced by Israel's systematic raising of the Gaza Strip to the ground, thereby reviving the key objective of Saudi-Israeli normalization. Conduct democratic elections that a thoroughly discredited and detested Palestinian authority will win and establish the Oslo status quo as a political horizon. I have one last point and I'll wrap up. It would of course be far simpler for Washington to demand an immediate cessation of hostilities, an end to the Egyptian-Israeli blockade and moratorium on all settlement activity beyond the 1967 boundaries and demand an orderly Israeli withdrawal to the 1967 lines within 12 months. Give Israel the option to do so without an agreement as it insisted on doing in the Gaza Strip in 2005. In the, alter in the alternate universe that is Washington, however, the international consensus on a peaceful resolution of the question of Palestine is also wishful thinking. At the very least, finally, this crisis has punctured the smugness of Biden, Sullivan, Blinken, and McGurk, and their comfort with the Middle East constructed for them by Netanyahu. It is for the Palestinians, and more generally the Arabs, to use this opportunity to compel Washington to accept a Middle East that has no room for the policies U.S. decision makers and their Israeli partners have for so long sought to shove down their throats. Thank you. Thank you, Maine. Uh, next, I'll turn to Stephen Simon, who is a professor of practice in Middle East studies at the Henry Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington, and a senior research fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft who, among other things, has authored this book, uh, which I read and really liked, Grand Delusion, The Rise and Fall of American Ambition in the Middle East, that I would really recommend for everyone uh, to read if you're interested in the Middle East, uh, Middle East policy and US foreign policy in general, um, but also a, a article on in foreign affairs on uh, a plan to return the Gaza Strip to Palestinians and keep Israel safe. Stephen, what's your assessment of what US policy is trying to accomplish and, and where do you think it's going from here? 
uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, Omar. Um, and, and thank you for having me on this uh, panel. I really appreciate it. Um, what the U.S. policy is trying to accomplish uh, right now is, um, you know, a cauterization uh, of the current crisis um, because of its potential for escalation and widening to a regional war, uh, and because uh, the humanitarian costs are um, immense, as other um, panelists have pointed out. So that's their main objective. Um, in crises like these, uh, from my experience, uh, the, the immediate objective is to try and manage Israel's response. Uh, and uh, this situation is no different. Well, it is different maybe in, a, in, 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 one, uh, in one way, which is not unimportant. Um, which is that surprise attacks are, are deranging events. And as uh, Richard Betts, um, yeah, he's a political scientist at, uh, at Columbia, you know, has, has written um, uh, quite persuasively, you know, surprise attacks are not deranging. Um, and just in that um, they come, they appear to come out of the blue, uh, but because uh, they present um, uh, the victims uh, or the targets uh, government's um, response uh, is it becomes extremely difficult uh, to pull together. Uh, and that's just that's a function of the surprise on the one hand, and it's a function of the structure of of uh, government uh, decision making. Uh, processes on the other. So, uh, and that's what we're that's what we're seeing here, and it's affected uh, both the United States and Israel. Israel more more powerfully because there's a, a domestic political context in which the government is, um, you know, is making decisions. So, um, uh, so in, in that in that light, the United States is uh, uh, is engaged in constraining. Uh, Israel to the best of its ability. Uh, it's done that uh, fairly well uh, so far in that um, the, the, the escalation, the step change uh, that the United States is trying to affect is um, the incursion on the ground of a large uh, Israeli uh, force. The Israelis have mobilized uh, more or less instantaneously 360,000 reservists. Um, uh, for those of you who don't keep track of things, the regular army, well, the regular arm, armed forces are about 170,000, 169,000, I think. So, um, you know, this is a pretty large force. And, uh, it, you know, a lot of it will be allocated to the Northern Front. Uh, but that will leave plenty uh, for uh, a Gaza incursion. Uh, this is not something that the United States um, uh, desires uh, particularly, so um, it's going to try to prevent Israel from doing that. The first step um, uh, that, uh, that the United States and, and some of its uh, uh, Western partners are now, um, uh, you know, have been doing is keeping uh, a flow of senior officials and government leaders into Israel because it puts a spoke into Israel's uh, wheel. Um, uh, the Israelis cannot launch a ground invasion of Gaza when Tony Blinken is there or uh, Lloyd Austin uh, or the commander of CENTCOM uh, or the president of the United States, the president of France, and shortly um, the prime minister of Britain. So these are all delaying tactics. I mean, they serve these visits serve other purposes as well, but they are crucial uh, delaying tactics. Uh, secondly, in its public remarks, uh, the administration has, from the very outset, laid down markers um, regarding uh, civilian casualties. 
Um, and Biden did that in his first big speech, where he gives a sort of big wind up, um, uh, which was uh, delivered in kind of emotional terms. And then, and then his punchline is, you know, there's there's one thing that separates, uh, you know, the United States and Israel from Hamas, and um, that is, uh, we don't target civilians. Now, that was a carefully phrased. Um, a punchline uh, in that um, it refers to the targeting of civilians as against the inadvertent um, uh, inflicting of civilian casualties. This is sort of a grayish area um, uh, in customary international law. But in any case, it was a marker for the Israelis not to um, uh, disregard the issue of, of excessive civilian casualties or civilian casualties at all. Um, uh, and, and the focus on the ground incursion uh, owes to the fact that, owes to two things, really. And I think, and, and once I lay them out, I'll, I will uh, surrender, uh, surrender the floor. Uh, the one is uh, that uh, the understanding that civilian casualties will increase uh, exponentially if there's a ground incursion, because military operations in urban terrain are um, uh, colossally difficult uh, to carry out. Uh, they're casualty intensive for the attacker. And, um, you know, in this case, or in, uh, you, you know, in, in terms of doctrine, I suppose, uh, in, in among Western armies, the invading or the, in, however you want to put it, um, uh, armed force will attempt to displace uh, that casualty burden onto the enemy. And that means a lot of damage. That means a lot of damage. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing uh, is that, you know, the Israelis, um, I mean, since certainly since 1973, uh, Israelis and Arabs have not been fighting with um, um, anything resembling uh, a realizable strategic objective um, uh, in view, uh, which is one of the reasons that it's all seemed so pointless and it's easily it's it's easy to become as uh, just you know um, nihilistic about it um uh, I think what I what I the impression I get from talking to U.S officials and um uh and just reading the sort of the news is that uh, the United States is trying to encourage um uh, Israel to think in terms of some, uh, realistic political objective for the immense uh, violence uh, it will unleash on Gaza. And um, uh, so this is really pushing the Israelis to do something that they haven't done in decades, or any of the parties to the conflict have really done in decades. If you're going to go to war and you're going to inflict a lot of damage, what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to achieve that is feasible and that gets you into a better place? Um, and uh, so that's that's what all these Americans uh, are doing. I think you know. Not, I, I'm, I I won't um, really attempt to rebut um, you know points made by my other panelists, which I feel some of which anyway. I mean, I've enjoyed the presentations tremendously, if that's the right word. Um, I've learned a lot, uh, but um, uh, some of some of what I've heard tends to conflict with what I kind of understand to be the case, especially given uh, my experience as as um, as Muin put it, as being in, inside the bubble. You know. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Um, well, so the U.S. is trying to um, prevent a ground invasion, uh, but the um, the bombing is continuing. And one of the things I wanted our guests to touch on is, um, you know, what 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 are their assessment of of what we should be sort of thinking about right now, particularly in light of the regional factor. 
uh, this is something increasingly I've been asked, and it's been on everyone's mind, which is the chances for a wider regional escalation that will significantly increase, as, as many of you have said, the, um, the rate of, of destruction in, in ways that are unmanageable, I mean, depending on how kind of wide it escalates. So maybe I'll come back to you, Matt, to just give us your thoughts about that. I mean, given that even without a ground invasion, there's there's these increasing tensions that it might happen anyway. Right. Right. I mean, I think we're already seeing a, you know, massive resistance or or or, or criticism from the region. I think that's be, to be expected, but I would point specifically to the remarks given by uh, Jordan's King Abdullah uh, at a meeting in Cairo a few days ago that I think not, not only represented the views of many in the region, but many in the global south, the non-aligned world, the developing world, whatever term one would like to use, which is one of a massive double standard um, toward, for example, you know, Ukrainians killed by a Russian invasion and Palestinians killed um, by is Israeli bombardment. Uh, the application uh, of international law, things that are treated as fairly cut and dried when Russia is applying them to Ukrainians, all of a sudden seem less clear when Israel is applying them or using them on Palestinians. Um, so I think that is that is an enduring problem. Again, we shouldn't pretend that there is never going to be tensions or some level of hypocrisy in the practice of foreign policy. But I think the double standard in this case is so glaring that it is, you know, it's and I and I wrote this elsewhere. I mean, this the, the administration has really made an effort, and I think a good faith effort and an important one, to build relationships and make an argument to non-aligned countries on a whole range of issues. Um, but again, part of that is one to, you know, strategic competition with China, trying to arrest and put the brake on and box out China, or at least compete with China in building relationships across the, these regions. And I think that effort took an enormous hit um, over the past few weeks, particularly the effort to bring a lot of these countries on board to support um, the defense of Ukraine, which is a policy that I have supported and continue to support. Um, so I, I really regret that. Um, I would just make a couple responses to to some other points that were made. I mean, I do think, um, as as Stephen said, I mean, even though I don't think the administration has done nearly enough, in my view, to 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 constrain the Israelis in this bombardment, I I do think the president's trip there, you know, the goal, as I think is clear, was twofold: was one to show solidarity with the people of Israel, but also to put the brakes on and create space for the Israelis to really think hard about what they seemed like they were about to do. Um, and I think that was very important. I think that averted for the moment an even worse catastrophe. Um, I think that is very much worth noting. Um, but ultimately, it, it, as I see it, it's, 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 it's really not enough. I mean, I would go back to, you know, May 2021, which is where we saw the last major flare up, the last you know, um, you know, you know, bombing campaign against Gaza because of events that actually began in in Jerusalem, and it's you know we've had I think whatever five rounds of this since 2009's cast lead, and so, you know just being okay with this policy of you know what the Israelis call quote unquote mowing the grass, which is a completely offensive and inhumane uh, way of putting it. Um, this goes I think to the the problem here, which was imagining that we could just keep this status quo going and it would keep a lid on this problem without taking into account the very, very serious costs to Palestinian lives every single day. But of course, not really taking, a, not making a realistic assessment of risks, which is what has now kind of blown up in, in, in their faces. Thank you, Matt. Um, Sarah, can I bring you back in if you're if you're still with us? And um, I mean, you've been quite uh, adamant about the calls for a ceasefire, as been many others. Um, I mean, give us your your sense of that. And I should also say that you were <clears throat> one of the um, critics, uh, I should say, uh, before the October seventh of what seemed to be an imminent U.S. Saudi Israeli deal. Um, so maybe. I'm sort of asking you both both questions, but fo focus on whichever of these kind of in, in light of the regional factor, but also um, your sense of what should happen now. Yeah, um, but before I do that, I just want to raise some skeptical 
thinking about the notion that the United States has tried to play a restraining role uh, with respect to Israel. Um, certainly the facts don't uh, show that. The facts of the massacre of thousands of Palestinians, approximately 2,500 of them children. If that's a picture of the U.S. influencing Israel for restraint, um, then that's uh, pretty pretty pathetic and, and pretty sad. And again, it's like we have to ignore the fact that the United States just vetoed a humanitarian pause, but still uh, 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 want us want ourselves to believe that the United States has played a restraining role. Um, I think that the reasons that Israel has not carried out its ground invasion are much more complex. I think it has to do with their own insecurities and fears about what they will face when they enter Gaza. And, uh, you know, it's going to make, as some others have noted, Afghanistan a cakewalk. Um, they're not just going to go building by building uh, looking for people who may or may not be members of Hamas. They're going to have to go apartment by apartment. And I am certain that it would cause a very, very high Israeli death toll. Um, and so I think that the reasons for not having a ground invasion are certainly more complex. And if you look at the American actions, uh, everything has been uh, to green light, uh, encourage, support, protect uh, Israel from doing uh, what it wants. Second, I think it is important to note um, that Israel's bombardment uh, has not only been indiscriminate, i.e. Uh, failing to distinguish between military and civilian uh, uh, objects, military and civilian targets, but also deliberate. Israel has deliberately targeted civilians, and it does so openly by refusing to abide by international law rules that require that you can only target combatants. Instead, Israel openly says that it treats anyone associated with Hamas, anyone who supports Hamas, including the justice ministry, including the traffic police, uh, as legitimate targets, and it has done so for a very, very long time. Uh, and that means that they are, in fact, deliberately targeting civilians because they are deeming them to be people they want to target regardless of international law. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, what I am most worried about now, um, and I think it reflects on the one hand, zero plan in place uh, for the day after whatever uh, invasion Israel thinks it can carry out uh, in Gaza, um, is what we're seeing uh, of uh, using the existing anti-ISIS coalition uh, to attach uh, a, a war against Hamas uh, as part of that rubric, as part of that framework. When I first predicted that that was going to happen, uh, people were dismissive. But just today, President Macron made that very specific proposal of expanding the anti-ISIS coalition to include uh, a fighting Hamas uh, as if it is part of uh, part of ISIS. And so the risk of, number one, bringing in uh, uh, the United States and other countries as parties to this conflict, which is exactly what Israel wants uh, and has been their game plan, their only game plan, if anything, all along, and uh, expanding the war uh, to Syria, uh, to Lebanon, to Iraq, where there have been attacks uh, against uh, U.S. military installations, U.S. military bases. Again, this is exactly what Israel wants. Israel doesn't want to make this about its occupation in Palestine. Israel wants to make this about fighting terrorism. And unfortunately, uh, uh, the U.K., now France, uh, now uh, 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 um, uh, the U.S. seem to be willing to go along with it. Um, finally, just the, the 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 humanitarian aid angle. I I I'm, I want everybody to be very very cautious when we hear uh, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, and President Biden talking about the need for aid and um, the need to uh, urge Israel to respect international law as if it has been respecting international law uh, ever. Um, is that uh, I see the. Uh, efforts to talk about humanitarian aid as a diversionary tactic so that they can punt and avoid what we actually need, which is a ceasefire, a, a complete ceasefire. Instead, we can talk about whether it's 20 convoys or 30 convoys and how much do they have and how are we going to make sure that Hamas doesn't get the aid um, in order to deflect from the conversation um, that the international community wants to have 
which is a ceasefire. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we have a question from the audience, and please feel free to submit questions if you have any. But first, Moine, I know you wanted to yes. say a couple of things. Just very briefly, um, regarding one of the points um, Sarah raised, um, most senior Israeli officials, including its head of state, have openly stated that in the Gaza Strip, there is no distinction between the civilian population and armed combatants. Um, and therefore, um, I, I think that explains what, what she characterizes as deliberately indiscriminate uh, bombing, because um, if there's no distinction, you can um, uh, kill anything that moves, in effect. I, I also want to just one brief comment in response to um, Matt and the point he raised about Ukraine. Um, when the U.S. first started mobilizing international support for Ukraine, it did so on the basis that this was um, um, illegal aggression by Russia, invasion of a foreign country, and so on. And for a variety of reasons, um, that failed to gain sufficient traction, particularly in the global south, either because um, people were um, basing their relations with Russia out of interests uh, rather than principle and so on. And I think what, what we've seen in the past year is the U.S. increasingly stating that um, uh, this um, uh, support to Ukraine is not only about resisting foreign aggression, but it also involves a much broader principle, that of upholding what the U.S. calls um, the rules-based international order. And I think what Biden and Blinken have, have achieved um, with stunningly rapid success in the past two weeks have been to show how their rules-based international order works um, uh, in practice. Uh, you know, you have one set of rules for yourself and your friends um, and another set of rules uh, for everyone else. And, and I would make the argument that what has been a key argument mobilized by the US and Western Europe in the Ukraine context in the past year has been irreversibly um, uh, shattered. Thank you. Thank you, Moine. Um, I do want to bring in um, the, the regional factor and uh, our question from our friend and colleague, Professor Michael Clare, um, which I'll read right now. We have seen a massive uprising of popular support for the Palestinians in the Arab and the Muslim world, forcing their governments <clears throat> to step back from potential ties with Israel under the Abraham Accords. I guess this refers to Saudi Arabia in, in particular, but in a broader sense as well. Will this persist after all this is over? Um, who would like to, maybe uh, Stephen, do you wanna talk a little bit about the regional factor as well? Uh, would you like, uh, unmute please. Well, it's a good question. Um, uh, certainly, um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, you know, um, <laughs> well, he he leads opinion. I'm not so sure um, the extent to which he follows it. Um, so uh, he might well uh, still be determined uh, to make uh, a normalization process with Israel work, uh, even, um, you know, subsequent to the uh, crisis uh, that we're talking about. I know it's still going to be on the U.S. agenda, um, you know, for various reasons. Um, uh, so it, it, it will get some push from Washington, but much will depend on the way in which uh, the, the crisis unfolds. And we really don't know. We don't know if, if Israel is going to enter Gaza in a big way. We don't know if the war is going to expand to include uh, uh, Hezbollah or, or Iran. Uh, we really, we, we, all the key variables, uh, you know, are, are really unknown uh, at this point. But, uh, but I suspect that uh, whether this is in the category of wishful thinking or, uh, you know, simply, uh, you know, prudent planning, um, uh, it, 
I think the parties, particularly uh, the United States and and the Saudis, because the the two are are in very close um, uh, communication now, are looking uh, to some sort of political process uh, in the wake of the conflict uh, that will uh, provide a framework uh, for normalization or reciprocally, um, a normalization um, uh, um, a process that will provide a context for a political one um, involving uh, Israel and the Palestinians. By the way, Stephen, just a quick follow-up. What does Macron even mean by an international coalition to fight Hamas, expanding that? I mean, I, I find that baffling, the phrasing and the suggestion or does that mean anything to you, or is that suggesting something broader? Or no, I don't think it means anything to Macron either. Um, uh, you know, I think their talking points, uh, you know, <laughs> chinned up uh, at the K and um, uh, you know, fed to him. Uh, there, there is. You see, the Hamas ISIS uh, equation um, uh, was. Uh, I mean, emerged on on October seventh uh, because um, the uh, because Hamas had thrown out the rule book uh, on uh, attacking civilians as against um, uh, combatants, regular regular forces, and uh, which is what the Israeli president was referring to when he said that well, there's no distinction between uh, you know. Palestinian civilians and and Palestinian fighters because uh, you know Hamas they threw out that rule book on October seventh. I'm just don't shoot the messenger. Just explaining the reasoning here. So um, uh, I think that equation between uh, ISIS and Hamas was seized upon uh, by um, uh, by Macron's people as uh, um, uh, some you know, uh, new innovative frame in which to um, uh, look at, at management of the crisis. But I don't think anybody takes it particularly seriously. Um, uh, the important thing is that he's there. And as long as he's there, the Israelis, you know, can't, can't launch a ground incursion. Thank you, Stephen. Sarah, I, I see your hand is up. Yeah, uh, well, I, I wanted to just chime in and answer to your question about the, what the French want, because I asked uh, uh, some of my contacts in the French uh, uh, foreign ministry exactly that question. And I just want to read to you um, the, the uh, I don't want to use the, the language that he said. And he said, the idea is to draw on the experience of the international coalition against Daesh and see what aspects can be replicated against Hamas. We are therefore available to work with our partners in Israel to identify appropriate courses of action against Hamas. It will then be up to our partners in Israel in particular to express their needs. Uh, as a reminder, the coalition against Daesh is not limited to operations on the ground, but also involves training Iraqi forces, sharing information, and combating the financing of terrorism. Um, so, so that's what he said. But uh, I just want to clarify, um, Stephen, um, Israel's efforts to equate Hamas um, with ISIS and before that with Al-Qaeda is nothing new. It didn't start on October 7. Uh, this has been the approach of Israeli authorities for a long time. Uh, similarly, Israel's, quote unquote, as you say, throwing out the rule book didn't start on October 7 or October 8. Uh, Israel has disregarded the uh, international laws prohibiting the targeting of civilians, uh, limiting targeting to combatants and members of armed groups uh, 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 in Gaza and also in the West Bank uh, for a very long time, certainly since 2006 when Hamas was elected. Israel has said since 2006 um, that they believe that anyone who supports Hamas, anyone who's affiliated Hamas, whether in a civilian or military function, is quote unquote a terrorist and therefore someone that they can attack. So 
I think it is important for us to understand that this is not a new approach of Israel. Um, it might be certainly an angrier one that we've seen before because of the shocking uh, level of the Palestinian attack uh, on southern Israel. Um, but the uh, approach vis-a-vis -vis international law, the approach vis-a-vis -vis targeting civilians, the approach vis-a-vis -vis likening Hamas to ISIS or Al-Qaeda is not new. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we're approaching the end of the webinar. So I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> uh, sorry, I know, Mayan, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to make sure to touch on the questions that were asked. Um, I'll maybe read them briefly and then see if everyone has a last comment. Uh, uh, maybe we'll we'll go through and then you'll go next, Moin. Uh, Mandy Turner writes that uh, I found Moin's presentation fascinating that there's a collapse of U.S. confidence in Israeli politically, political and military capabilities. Uh, my first question relates to the possibility of the U.S. forcing Netanyahu to step down in favor of someone that will bring Israel together again. Um, my second question relates to a topic that is not addressed in the webinar, but is in all our minds, the issue of Palestinian leadership. Mustafa Barghouti seems to be coming forward, at least in the West, as a clear leader, but he does not have much support locally in Palestine. Who do the pal panelists see as a possible leadership coming up? <clears throat> um, another person is asking about their assessment of Egypt's stand on this crisis. Do they think Egypt will give in to the pressures to leave Sinai to the Palestinian refugees. Um, a question by Ronit, don't you think the USA sees Hamas as a terrorist group and is part of the fight against terrorism? And finally, uh, Paul Arts, Professor Paul Arts, uh, if Israel succeeds in destroying Hamas, and that is a big if, is there any idea how Gaza is going to be administered and what are the options? So three minutes to solve all of these. Uh, Moine, you want to? Yes, I, I just wanted to um, first briefly um, respond to uh, um, a point Stephen made, and you mentioned Hamas throwing out the rule book on October 7th. Well, the scale was certainly unprecedented. As you know, um, Hamas has engaged in numerous attacks on civilian targets over the years. Think of the suicide bombings during the Second Intifada, for example. Um, so I would question that. And secondly, the statement by um, the Israeli president, Herzog, um, what he, he said there was no distinction for a very specific reason. He said these people voted for Hamas. These people could have risen up and overthrown Hamas, and they didn't, and therefore there is no distinction um, uh, between the population and, and the combatants. I mean, you know, imagine... If, uh, if if such uh, criteria were applied to countries uh, that take pride in their democratic uh, structures. Well, now, you know, interestingly, um, it's it's actually, and, and perversely, it's a Bin Laden quote. Huh. Well, since we're talking about comparisons with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. <laughs> um, now, um, uh, regarding uh, the question about Egypt uh, first, you know, there's, there was a lot of talk, um, uh, CC is under siege because of the Menendez scandal, he's desperate for new IMF loan, and it's not going to be that difficult to persuade him to receive um, the population of the Gaza Strip into Sinai. I would like to recall that refusing um, the principle of making the Gaza Strip an Egyptian rather than Israeli problem has been a constant principle of Egyptian regional policy since the 1970s. Um, at Camp David, Begin offered the Gaza Strip to uh, uh, Sadat, and he refused. And, and that's been the case on other occasions. And, and I would argue, yes, uh, Sisi is an autocrat and a dictator, um, but even if he were to uh, be enticed by uh, such, such a proposal, I think there are also Egyptian institutions um, and other power centers that would insist on having the last word. And so I think that this is not a decision that CC and CC alone um, can take and impose on the um, uh, Egyptian state apparatus. Regarding um, the, I, I think the US would very much like to see a different 
Israeli coalition. And I think um, uh, the expansion of the coalition and the forming of an emergency war cabinet is in part a, a response um, uh, to, to US policy. But the idea that the US is going to come in and reconfigure the Israeli government, I think, um, is is a stretch too far. I don't I don't really see that um, uh, happening. And as far um, as Palestinian leadership is concerned, uh, this is a, this is the yeah. last point I'll respond to. I, I think it's a very difficult. I, I think ultimately it remains um, a two party system, um, and you know we've seen it with Saddam Fayyad, we've seen it um, with Mustafa Barghouti and others. I think. Any leader um, who does not emerge from one of the two uh, main parties is going to be confronting extreme challenges seeking to achieve national leadership. If it's if it's a coalition or power sharing agreement, then I think much more is possible. Um, but at this point, I think it's impossible uh, to predict what, if any, type of leadership. Uh, will succeed um, uh, Abbas when he's finally um, departed from the scene. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. We're technically out of time, although we started a couple minutes late. So I'll just quick last remarks, Matt, Stephen, and then we'll have the last word for Sarah. No, I'll just very quickly address the issue of Palestinian leadership. I think that's right. Um, but it's also, again, been the strategy of Netanyahu and previous Israeli governments was to you know, bolster Hamas in in Gaza because that could keep the Palestinians divided and down. You know, I certainly don't absolve the various Palestinian parties and leaders for their own um, choices here. But you know, there was a really interesting uh, transcript of a, a Likud meeting from 2019 where Netanyahu said explicitly that anyone who opposes the Palestinian state needs to continue supporting getting money to Hamas. Um, that's part of you know the status quo that we absolutely can't return to. Obviously, that will not happen with Hamas, but the bigger strategy of keeping the Palestinians divided and down so as to vo avoid any possibility of having to make an agreement. Thank you. Stephen? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't really have much to uh, much to add. I don't think that there's been a collapse, uh, I suppose, in, in confidence in the Israeli military. Um, this issue um, really arose uh, because of the current government's policies on the West Bank, on the one hand, which diverted uh, uh, soldiers from Southern Command to Central Command. They were chopped to a different command. Uh, and, and an issue relating to um, Problems one sees in intelligence communities all over the world um, in, you know, in the face of surprise attack. I mean, they, they just haven't questioned their assumptions in a long time. They just routinely reaffirm them, and then they get surprised when it turns out that their assumptions uh, uh, were, were obsolete. So I don't think that there's an issue uh, with the IDF and, and certainly the Israeli um, uh, public and the U.S. military, as far as as far as I'm aware, um, uh, you know, have full confidence, remarkable confidence, actually, uh, in the IDF. It's really the Israeli intelligence community that that looks uh, pretty bad uh, right now. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, just trying to unmute. Um, uh, I guess I would just make two quick comments. Um, first of all, to emphasize that um, though we are sitting here uh, in this panel in the comfort of our homes uh, in the United States, most of us, I don't know where you are, Maureen, um, the United States, we, uh, our tax dollars, um, we're not detached observers here. You know, we're not just sitting back watching um, what Israel is doing, maybe giving them advice or not giving them advice. Um, the United States is part of this war. The United States is supplying Israel the weapons that it's using to terrorize Palestinians. And if you don't care about the morality and ethics of that, then there should be more concern than there has been about the criminal liability of U.S. officials, um, because providing weapons to uh, a party, knowing that they're going to use them to carry out war crimes, observing the war crimes they're carrying out, 
is something that you can be found criminally liable for under the Rome Statute. Um, the second thing I would say is just to thank security in context for organizing this event, um, because uh, you may or may not be surprised to know that events just like this are being canceled in the United States, left and right. Uh, uh, book talks, uh, a book by Nathan Thrall about the life of the Palestinian under occupation um, was canceled. Um, a, a, a lecture by uh, an American uh, National Book Award winner um, was canceled at the 92nd Street Y because uh, he uh, uh, dares to support Palestinian rights. People are being fired from their jobs for saying the sorts of things that I've said today. Um, uh, uh, university professors, students uh, are being being uh, 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 recorded and threatened uh, uh, with prospects for future employment um, for saying the very same things that some of us here have been saying. So I think that we need to understand both the complicity of our government in this war, which is clearly uh, something we should recognize as the slaughter of Palestinians. I'm not using those words flippantly or casually. I'm using them very deliberately. Um, and second is to resist these, you know, pretty unprecedented efforts uh, to silence Americans from expressing support for Palestinians and Palestinian rights. Um, uh, um, first of all, I don't think it's going to stop there, but certainly now it's focused on that. And I hope we can all resist those efforts to silence us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for your honesty and your very thoughtful interventions. I think uh, I've learned a lot and, and our audience as well. Thank you to the audience. <clears throat> um, and thank you all for your questions. We'll obviously keep talking and, and thinking together about this. So uh, have a good day. <laughs>